Well, hello to everybody, and this is our video for the third week of our book club. So we have one more week to go in reading on Clement, reading our book, The Four Witnesses, in the first section. So one more week with the first section on uh, the early church father, Clement. Well, for today's video, um, one of the things that Rod Bennett discusses in this first section on Clement is the fact that Clement was a successor to St. Peter as Bishop of Rome. And so I felt like it was an important topic to dive into a little more deeply um, as far as what do we mean by Bishop of Rome and successor to St. Peter and how this relates to the role of the Pope or the papacy. Um, so we refer to our present Bishop of Rome as the Pope, and currently it's Pope Francis. And this word Pope comes from the Greek word papas, and this basically just means father. And early in the church, all bishops were called papas, or were called Pope, or were called father, because as leaders in the church, they are our spiritual fathers. And we also today call not only our bishops as can be referred to as fathers, but also our priest can be referred to as fathers. Because again, there are spiritual fathers, just like we refer to Father Abraham as our father in the faith, or the early Christians saw St. Paul as being a father to them. And when St. Paul writes to the Christians, sometimes he'll refer to them as his spiritual sons, because there is this sense of a relationship. And there's a recognition of this fatherly role that the leaders in the church, the priests and the bishops play in our life. But what happened is that since the Bishop of Rome has a very unique role in the church, over time, the use of the word papas or Pope became limited to him um, to basically make his unique role more evident. And so I want to talk a little bit more about this is why is the Bishop of Rome? Why does he have a unique role? Um, why is he called Pope and why is this significant? One of the other things to just kind of touch on too is understanding that what we mean by um, the Bishop of Rome. What is the Bishop of Rome? What does that mean? This means that the Bishop, um, who we call all bishops in the Catholic Church successors to the Apostles, and I'll speak more about that in a minute, but all bishops are successors to the Apostles. And all bishops are given a specific um, territory to oversee and to govern. And this territory is referred to as a diocese. And so you have the Diocese of Rome in Italy. You have the Diocese of Dallas in Texas. You have the Diocese of Tyler in Texas. And so a diocese is a territory um, that this particular bishop is given oversight of. So the bishop of the Diocese of Dallas is the bishop of that whole area, and he has a responsibility and a duty of governing that the people in the church of that diocese. Um, and so just as you have the bishop of Dallas, Texas, or just as you have the bishop of Tyler, Texas, you have the bishop of Rome in Italy. And so as bishop of Rome, the pope has responsibility to oversee that diocese, that territory of Rome. He is to hand on the faith to the people of that diocese, to govern it, to sanctify it, um, uh, to teach, to discipline. So he does have a responsibility specifically for that diocese of Rome. But because he is Pope and successor to St. Peter, he also has additional responsibilities and duties, which is what I want to talk more about here in a minute. Um, but before I jump into his role beyond overseeing the Diocese of Rome, I also want to make just one other comment about bishops. Um, all bishops in the Catholic Church, as I mentioned, are successors to the apostles. And in an upcoming video, we're going to talk more, talk more about what's called apostolic succession, which is an important um, uh, mark of the church. It's an important um, hierarchical um, structure to the Catholic Church. And what we mean by this is that all of the bishops in the Catholic Church today, through their ordination, can trace themselves all the way back to one or more of the 12 apostles. 
And so there's this lineage. It's not by blood, it's not by genealogy, but they're successors to the apostles through their ordination, through the laying on of hands. When that particular man was ordained to the um, office of bishop, then two or more bishops had to lay hands on him to elevate him to that office. And through that laying on of hands, that ordination, we can trace all bishops all the way back to the apostles. And again, we'll talk more about this in, in, a, in, a, in an upcoming video. But with the Bishop of Rome, he can trace himself all the way back specifically to St. Peter. And you can, you can even on the internet just search, um, you know, the Pope, a list of popes, and you'll be able to find all of the popes from Pope Francis all the way back to St. Peter. And Pope Francis is the 265th successor of St. Peter. And we can trace that line directly back all the way to St. Peter himself. And so that's, that's another reason the Bishop of Rome is unique, because not only is he given governance um, over the Diocese of Rome, he is the successor to St. Peter himself, and St. Peter was the first Bishop of Rome. And because he is a successor to St. Peter, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, has some additional duties and responsibilities that I want to talk about today. And so one of the things that I, that's important to recognize is the role that St. Peter himself played among the 12 apostles at the time of Christ and then in the early church. So we all recognize that Jesus called 12 men to be um, apostles, what he referred to as apostles. And the word apostle just means sent or sent out. So Jesus called these 12 men to have a unique role as leaders in the church. But among these 12, Jesus also had an inner circle of three. Um, you had Peter, James, and John who had this inner circle, who had an even more intimate relationship with Christ. And you see this because they will be able to be with Christ during the transfiguration or whenever um, Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead or when Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Peter, James, and John were part of this inner circle who had an even more intimate role with Christ, an even more intimate relationship with Christ. And then what you'll see is, is if you continue to um, assess this relationship with the 12 apostles, you'll see that Christ also had an even more unique relationship with St. Peter. And I'm going to discuss that in the video today, is what is this special role that St. Peter had, and what's the evidence that St. Peter had a unique role compared to the other 11 apostles. And what we hold in the Catholic Church is that among the 12 apostles, Peter was seen as the chief apostle or the prince of the apostles. And so because of this, once Peter became Bishop of Rome, he was given not only the duty of governing that diocese of Rome, but he also had a unique role for the entire church, the universal church, to be the source of unity for the church as far as the leadership goes and that Peter had a unique role and a unique duty of guarding and protecting the church and her people. Um, and this role was um, similar to the other 11 apostles but more unique. And so there's a few examples we're going to talk about today um, but one of them we briefly touched on last time um, was the episode at the end, end of John's gospel, John chapter 21, after the resurrection, when Peter and Jesus are talking on the shore of Galilee, and, and um, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And then Peter will respond three times, Less, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus will respond to Peter. The first time he says, you know, tend um, or feed my lambs. The second time, tend my sheep. And the third time, feed my sheep. And this is just one instance of where we see Jesus calling on Peter to have a unique role in his church. And I'm going to spend more time on John 21 here in just a minute, but just to kind of give you an intro into where I'm going. So what we'll see as I talk more is there's going to be multiple instances that we can look at in the New Testament where we see Peter having this special role designated by Christ to play this special role of where we can recognize him as being the chief apostle or the preeminent apostle. And, um, and because of this special role Peter had, 
then once he dies and another man succeeds him as Bishop of Rome, then he takes on the responsibility not only of governing the Diocese of Rome, but also this special role that Peter himself had in the Universal Church, that this special role was also handed down to all of Peter's successors. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. And one of the reasons, just before I go on to talk about the evidence of um, Peter's role, is that the reason this is so important for our book is because Clement, this early church father that we're reading about, he was one of the successors of St. Peter. And so you had St. Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and then he was succeeded by a man named Linus, and then a man named Cletus, and then our person that we're reading about, Clement. And so Clement was the fourth bishop of Rome, or you can refer to him as the third successor to St. Peter as bishop of Rome. And again, as I said, he was not only given the duty of the bishop of, as bishop of Rome, but also having that unique role in the universal church that Peter also held, because this responsibility given to Peter is um, handed down through the office. Um, whoever holds the office as bishop of Rome takes on kind of this dual responsibility of being over the bishop, over the diocese of Rome, as well as being this uh, special father, this universal father to the entire church. One more thing before we talk more about Peter's role is to also mention that the Pope is um, one of the most common titles that we give to the Bishop of Rome um, because he's the universal father. But there's another title that's called the um, pontiff. This word pontiff is also used for the Pope. This comes from the Latin word pontifex, P-O-N-T-I-F-E-X, which means bridge builder because the, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, is seen as being a unifier of the entire church and he also has the responsibility not only of Catholics, but of people of the world um, to help lead pe all people to come to know Christ. And so he has this role of, you know, bridge builder. So he's sometimes called the pontiff as well. Another title for the Bishop of Rome um, is Vicar of Christ because he is the successor of St. Peter. And St. Peter was a Vicar of Christ. And I'll show the evidence for that in a little while. So, but you can call him the Vicar of Christ. Um, the pontiff, the pope, um, and there's a few other um, kind of descriptions that people give of the pope, but these are the, probably the most common that you'll hear. Um, but um, but if, I'm not going to, I just want to, um, just to kind of keep that brief, we could probably talk all day about some of these other titles and, and things about the pope, but I'll, let's just dive back in. And, and I want to show really the emphasis today is to show this role that Peter had in the church and why it is that as Catholics we recognize that the Gospels, the New Testament, are showing us that Peter has this preeminent role, this role as chief apostle. And then if we can see this, that Peter has this unique role and these unique responsibilities among the other apostles, um, then we can also see why it is that we hold all of St. Peter's successors um, would have this same responsibility handed down to them. So, okay, um, so here, let's just jump right in. So our first, the first piece of evidence that I want to give um, to show why it is that we um, recognize that St. Peter was the chief apostle would be that any time in scripture when you see the list of the 12 apostles and they're mentioned by name, you're going to see that St. Peter is mentioned first. So for example, in Matthew chapter 10, verses two to four, it says, the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and then James, and then it goes on to list the other apostles, John and Philip, and so on, and the last one listed is Judas. Well, every time you see in scripture the list of the twelve apostles mentioned by name, Peter, Simon Peter, is always listed first. But we have to look at this and step back and say, okay, why is this list done this way? Because was Simon Peter the first apostle that was called? Because in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 10, when it gives the list, it says, first, Simon called Peter. Well, why does this say first? 
because was Peter the first man called to be an apostle chronologically? And the answer is no, Peter was not the first. Andrew was the first person that Jesus called to be one of the apostles, Andrew. So why does Matthew here describe the, when he's listing the names of the apostles, he says first Simon Peter. What does he mean by this word first? When we look at the Greek, the Greek word there is protos, P-R-O-T-O-S, protos. It can mean first in time, like chronologically, but that it's not exclusive to that. It can also mean foremost, best, chief, or preeminent. And so when we look at these lists, we know that Simon Peter was not the first called chronologically, as an apostle, to be an apostle. So one of these other um, uh, definitions for protos must be what was meant. So we can put in this list, we can substitute first in our, because as we think of first, we often think chronologically. But what that means there, first, Simon called Peter, it means protos, Simon called Peter. And we can substitute there, instead of first, put um, chief or preeminently, something like that, because that's really what Matthew is trying to say, is that preeminently Simon called Peter, or the chief of the apostles, basically, Simon called Peter. Um, And so this gives us a sense that there is some unique role that Peter is playing, and this is what we see in all the lists. Peter is always listed first, so we have to ask, why is that? And so we would say that it's because he is the chief apostle, the prince of the apostles, the preeminent apostle. So that's one piece of evidence. The other thing is that any um, any time that the 12 apostles are not listed by name and they're referred to like as a group collectively, then it's usually, if not always, listed as, quote, Peter and the others. And so it's when they're calling, they're, when, the, um, when the Gospels are trying to um, discuss the 12 apostles as a group, Peter and the others. So again, there's a hint or suggestion that Peter has this unique role among them. And then also consider this. If you look at the entire New Testament and you count how many times each of the apostles are listed by name, Peter, Simon Peter, is listed 195 times by name, either called Simon or called Peter or called Simon Peter or um, uh, Kepha, which is his Aramaic name, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you count all the times that Simon Peter is referred to by name, it's 195 times. The next most frequent person who is listed by name is the Apostle John, or of the Apostles. Um, The next most frequently named Apostle is the Apostle John, and he's listed just under 50 times. So St. Peter, 195, and St. John, less than 50 times. Now, this in and of itself does not tell us that Peter has a unique role, But if you combine this with all the other evidence, then it starts to kind of suggest that there is something we're we're being told by the number of times that he's mentioned. And again, we would say that this is just another suggestion referring to the preeminence of St. Peter. Now, I want to get back into John chapter 21. We spoke about this last time, um, and I referred to it just briefly a moment ago. But in John 21, as I said, Peter and Jesus are talking Um, Jesus is asking Peter three times, do you love me? Peter responds three times, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then in in Jesus' responses about feeding my sheep, I'm going to look at the Greek that's used there a little bit more carefully because I think it does tell us a little bit more into what's happening. So the first time when Jesus tells Peter, um, feed my lambs, the Greek word used there is bosco. And then when Jesus says, tend my sheep, the Greek word there is poimeno. And then the third time he says, feed my sheep. And that Greek word for feed is bosco. And so if we look at this, the word bosco that's used twice for feed, it can mean literally to feed, but it also has a figurative meaning to spiritually nourish. Then the other Greek word that Jesus use here, uses here is poimeno, and this even has a stronger connotation because it means to tend, but it really means to tend like a shepherd, which includes feeding, nourishing, 
governing, leading, guiding. Um, and so it has this more specific meaning referring to shepherding, you know, the flock. And so basically we look at these Greek words and what Jesus is saying to Peter, you know, basically this passage is showing us that Jesus is telling Peter, when I go away, you are given charge of my flock in the church on earth. Jesus tells Peter, you must spiritually nourish them. You must tend them. You must govern them. You must guide them. And so Peter is being given this role of shepherd and shepherding Jesus' flock. And this is very unique. We do not see this happening to any of the other apostles or to anyone else. And so Peter is given these specific duties and responsibilities above what the other apostles are expected to do. Now, by making Peter a shepherd of his church, Jesus is not taking away anything from his own role. He's not, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. And by Jesus making Peter a shepherd, it does not minimize Jesus' role or negate Jesus' role. In John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And in this passage in John chapter 10, the, the Greek word there for um, shepherd is poimen, kind of connected to this idea where we say poimeno with tending the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd. So there's a connection there with this idea of just really emphasizing what Jesus is telling Peter to do is to shepherd his people. And in John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus has just said, I'm the good shepherd. And then Jesus says, and there is one flock and one shepherd. So again, by Jesus telling Peter, you are now basically a shepherd, or at least you have the duties of a shepherd. It's not to minimize Jesus's role or to negate Jesus's role. What, Pe what Jesus is doing is telling Peter that I will have to go away, but you will be left in charge until I return. And you're going to have specific duties and responsibilities of taking care of my flock. And that Peter is going to um, kind of be in charge of and responsible for all of the other apostles, all of the other leaders in the church, and all the people of the church. And that one thing that Peter is going to be expected to do is to guide the flock and to preserve unity among the flock until Jesus returns. And so this is kind of a significant um, event to help point us again towards the fact that Peter has this unique role among the other apostles. All right, so I want to show a few other examples. So if you look throughout the New Testament, there's a few other instances where we can see Peter's role of preeminence, or at least suggestions about Peter's role of preeminence. So in Acts chapter 2, after Pentecost, um, this is the very beginning of the church, we see that it's Peter who stands up and gives the first sermon. And as a response to this, you know, thousands and thousands of Jewish people hear Peter's sermon. And as a response, 3,000 people convert to Christianity. And so there's a sense that Peter has this um, role of leader, a unique leadership role by him stepping up and doing that. In Acts chapter 3, we see that the first person to perform a miracle after Pentecost is Peter. Um, we see that um, after Pentecost, Peter rebukes and basically, in a sense, excommunicates the first heretic of the church, who's Simon the Magician, in Acts chapter 8. And we talked about this last week. So Peter rebukes him, and there's this sense of Peter having this leadership role by him doing this. After Pentecost, Peter is the first one to raise someone from the dead, in Acts chapter 9. The other significant thing is if we look in Acts chapter 1, right before Pentecost, Judas has died, and so what? And so Peter is with the group of the apostles, and he quotes to them Psalm 69, verse 26, and Psalm 109, verse 8, and he reads, you know, quotes this passage from to them, and then he gives this unique interpretation of this old of these Old Testament passages, and basically tells the group that what God was revealing to them through this Old Testament passage was that they needed to appoint a successor to the Apostle Judas. And then Peter supervise, supervises this election process. So there's this sense again of Peter being in charge, of Peter taking this role of, of um, kind of this responsibility of leading the early church even then. Now I could go on with a whole lot of other lists where we see Peter uniquely interacting with Jesus or doing things uniquely in the church, but um, just for time's sake, I'm going to leave it to those few examples.
because there's two other passages I want to get into and spend a little time on because they're really significant to being a little bit more explicit um, and emphatic about G- Peter's role as you know having this unique preeminence. Because what we look at is if we look, if, if any of these things I've mentioned so far had happened in isolation, it wouldn't really carry much weight. But the fact that there's this large number of these examples where Peter has this unique role, um, which what appears to have this unique responsibility starts to add up to be, you know, evidence for what we claim is that Peter had a preeminence. Um, okay, so let's dive into two more passages. The first one is in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. In this passage, Jesus is going to pray personally only for St. Peter. So it's going to be significant. So let's read that. It says, um, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you. And right there, that word you is plural, meaning all of the apostles. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. And then Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, and this is singular, referring to Peter, that your faith, and again, that singular, referring to Peter, may not fail. So Jesus says, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And once you, and again, that's singular, so meaning, and once you, Peter, have turned back, strengthen your brethren. So there's this sense that all the apostles, Satan has demanded to sift them, to challenge them, to test them. And then it sounds like they're all going to fall away for a time, even Peter. But then Peter is going to turn back. He's going to turn back to Christ. And then when he does, Peter is given this duty and this responsibility to strengthen his brothers, to strengthen the other apostles. And so this is very significant because what we see is that there is an imminent attack that's coming it's going to be coming from satan and jesus is warning peter about this and satan's going to attack all of them but P- jesus is praying singularly for peter praying that peter's faith will not fail but also praying that once peter stumbles and falls away that he'll turn back and strengthen the other apostles so again this is a suggestion that peter has this preeminent role that he truly was kind of chief among the apostles and that even though he too will struggle, he would be given he would be given a special grace from Christ to strengthen the church and to govern the church and to preserve unity. All right, and then the last passage I want to dive into, and this is going to take a little bit of time, um, but we'll spend the rest of the time in this video on this passage. And this is a common passage that many people refer to when speaking about Peter. But this is Matthew chapter 16. And so when we look at Matthew chapter 16, um, what we're going to kind of especially focus on around verses 16 through 19. But when we, before we even read this passage, it's important to look at the context and even look at the setting, where this is happening and what Jesus is doing. And so as we begin to read this passage, it's important to keep in mind, so Jesus is going to take the 12 apostles and they're going to go on a very long journey to a place that is far north of Galilee. And then Jesus is going to ask the apostles, who do people say that I am? And then the apostles will reply, you know, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. And then Jesus will say, well, who do you say that I am? And then it's going to be Simon who will answer Jesus. And I'm going to um, we're going to go ahead and quote the section that I want to focus on, and then we're going to go into some more detail with it. So Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 16 through 19. And so after Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? It's Simon Peter answered, um, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, so we're going to really explore this um, in depth, but as I said, the first thing we want to do is look at the setting. I've already mentioned they go far north of Galilee. Um, and where they're going, where they're, where they're standing, 
um, when Jesus says these words and has this conversation with them, is in a city that's called Caesarea Philippi. So far north of Galilee would have taken them quite a while to get there. Um, and it's important to understand what this what this city at least looked like, um, because I think it is significant to this passage. Because Jesus, too, he was very very aware of symbolism. And so he would not just have been taking the apostles many, many miles north of Galilee for no reason to have this conversation, because he could have this conversation anywhere. So why does he take them to Caesarea Philippi? And I do think if we look at the setting and look at this city and some of the details about this city, you may start to begin to understand why Jesus might have done this. So Caesarea Philippi, it's a city that sat at the base of Mount Hermon, one of the larger mountains in this area. And this city um, was ruled, this whole area, this whole region, was ruled by Philip the Tetrarch. And Philip was the son of Herod the Great. And when he took over this region, this territory, he rebuilt, rebuilt the area and he renamed this particular city after himself. So Caesarea Philippi after himself, Philip. And this city was known for several other things too. Other than being named after Philip, it was also known um, because Philip built a very large temple to worship Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus had been a former Caesar of the Roman Empire who had died, but he was treated like a god among the Roman people, and he was worshipped. And so Philip built, built a large temple to Caesar Augustus in, in Caesarea Philippi. And this city also was formerly called Panias, um, which was a, it was because this city had been dedicated to the god Pan, P-A-N. And so in this city, there was also a large um, temple shrine to the god Pan. In Caesarea Philippi, there was also a temple to Zeus, the god Zeus. And then when you would look at this city, the city lies at the base of a huge rock promontory that rises kind of dramatically in the air about 200 feet. And then the side of this rock, which faces kind of south, is this sheer cliff. And towards the bottom of this cliff, you see niches that are um, in the rock, all throughout that rock face. And there would have been multiple pagan idols in each of these niches at the first century when Jesus would have been there. So you would have had a temple to Augustus, Caesar Augustus, a temple to the god Pan, a temple to the, the god Zeus. And then all these niches would have had various pagan idols, these statues in these niches. And so this is what it would have looked like. And there's other details, but these are kind of the most important I want to focus on for our discussion today, um, was that, that these um, various uh, temples and, and idols would have been there. One other thing that's um, that you can note, well, before I even go there, here's a little image. This is kind of a recreated um, depiction of what it most likely would have looked like um, in the first century. And so um, I've labeled these with five different numbers. Number one would have been the temple to Augustus Caesar. Number two would have been the temple to Zeus. Number three would have been the temple to Pan. And then number four is what was called like the court of Pan. And number five was called the grotto of Pan. And then as you can see, there's this cave there as well. And this cave was thought to be the source of the Jordan River. And it had a very, very deep chasm in that cave. And tradition says that from ancient times, the local pagan people kind of ref sometimes would refer to this cave as being the gate of Sheol or the gate of the underworld because it seemed like this bottomless pit. So sometimes people would say, oh, maybe it'll reach the underworld. So it's kind of like just this little tradition that people had. And so sometimes that people would call it by that name, the locals. And sometimes it was even reported that lo the local people would sometimes throw animals down in there um, into this chasm as uh, sacrificial offerings to the gods. And so as you can see, like symbolism of this area is abundant for what's happening in Matthew chapter 16. So you have a temple to Caesar Augustus who was considered a god to the Roman people, but he had died. And then you have these gods of Pan and Zeus who were mythical, they were not real. And then you have Jesus there with the apostles. And when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And Simon then says, 
you are the son, you are the you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. So this is very important. Not just any God, not to a God who is dead like Caesar Augustus, not to a mythical God like Pan or Zeus, but the Son of the One True God who is living and present and active in the world. So very significant. And then we have the temples to these false gods and these niches where these idols are put. And they're all built around this giant rock. But then Christ is going to tell us and tell the apostles that he is going to build his church on the rock. And we'll talk more about what Jesus means by this rock. But you can begin to see the symbolism here is that you have this giant rock promontory that they're standing near and they're looking upon as Jesus says these words. So it would have definitely been very symbolic and significant for them, for the apostles. And so kind of the over, before we even discuss the rock, we can begin to see that one of the things that's happening is that God wants all people to turn away from the false gods of this world and to turn to the one true God. That's really going to be one of the most important things that Jesus wants to accomplish and wants the apostles to accomplish is to bring people to the one true God and to turn away from the false, false gods. And so in Jesus' ministry and through his church, Jesus will reveal that not only has he been sent by this one true God, um, you know, but he also is God, you know, who's become man. And so he's come to save his people and to lead his people to truth and to goodness and to beauty and to lead his people to salvation. So don't rely on these false gods or these mythical gods. Turn to the one true God. That'll be an important message. Okay, so as we begin to look more at Matthew chapter 16, beyond looking at the setting of where this happened, we want to look at some of the words next of what, what, what's, hap what's happening. So when Simon professes who Jesus is, he professes truth. Um, you know, Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. But how does, Peter, how does Simon Peter know this? Well, Jesus tells us, because Jesus tells us that God the Father has revealed this truth to Peter, to Simon Peter, and that Simon had his heart and mind open to God being at work in him, and so Peter was able to respond to this truth that had been revealed to him, and then he professed it. He had enough faith in God and in what was being revealed to him in his heart that he professed it out loud. And so um, Jesus is calling, is recognizing Peter, Simon, Simon Peter has been inspired by God, and has had, um, you know, the, his heart and mind have been open to be able to have faith and profess it. And then the next thing that happens is an incredible thing, because Jesus will change Simon's name. This is a very unique and unusual thing that happens throughout the scriptures. And any time someone's name is changed by God in the Bible, it's significant. And when that happens, it's usually related to God trying to emphasize this person's mission, their vocation that God is giving them. And so we can see this with Abram in the Old Testament. Abram is a word that is a name that means exalted father. And then God will change his name to Abraham, which means father of nations. Because this is whenever God is telling Abraham, you know, God had called Abraham and promised him um, to have that he would give him a son, that he would uh, make Abram's name great, he would give him land, he would give him a kingdom. And then Abram had doubted. And so after God is reassuring Abram and re, um, kind of, uh, Abraham or Abram, sorry, Abram is renewing the covenant. When that happens, God changes Abram's name to Abraham, almost to emphasize that when God says to Abram, I am going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars, God is showing him how serious he is because he changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, from exalted father to father of nations. And so name changes are significant. We see this also with Jacob. Jacob's name uh, means to follow or to supplant. But eventually God is going to change Jacob's name to Israel. And Israel means one who wrestles with God. Um, so again, much can be said about the name change with Jacob and what that means. But it's just, it's significant, it's showing it's significant. It happens, it happens at significant moments in the lives of these people, and it usually reflects, or not even usually, it always reflects a change um, or an emphasis on the mission that God is giving them, and an emphasis on the relationship they're called to have with God. 
So what was Simon's new name when Jesus changes Simon's name? In English, we say Peter, and that's an English word that means rock. But Peter is a transliteration of what we see in the Greek New Testament of St. Matthew. So St. Matthew's um, gospel, the Greek version says um, that Simon's new name is Petros. Petros means rock. So in English, we say Peter, which means rock. So that's where we get this word Peter. But we cannot stop there because Greek was not the primary language that Jesus would have been speaking. We see like in the Gospel of Mark, for, for example, sometimes when Mark is writing, he will give us the exact words of Saint, um, he will give us the exact words of Jesus. And on these occasions where Mark gives us the exact words of Jesus, they're in Aramaic. And if we look at the region where Jesus was living, um, look at the fact that it was the Jewish culture, then it doesn't surprise us that Aramaic was the most likely language that Jesus spoke primarily. It's possible Jesus or some of the apostles knew Greek. It's possible they knew Latin, as people did speak those languages at times. But it's most likely that in this region, with being a part of the Jewish culture, that Jesus more likely um, than not spoke Aramaic primarily. And Aramaic is, is kind of a, it's a form of Hebrew. Um, and so Aramaic would have been what Jesus was probably speaking, speaking when he spoke to the apostles here in Matthew 16. So what was Simon's new name in Aramaic? His new name was Kepha, K-E-P-H-A. Now sometimes you'll see this written as Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S. They're both correct. Um, they both are this kind of Aramaic word that means rock. And we see this in the New Testament in several passages where Simon is Simon Peter is referred to as Kepha. And so we can, that also kind of helps to support that um, Jesus changed Simon's name, not to Peter and not to Petros, but to Kepha. And then what happens is as Kepha is translated to other languages, the, the name changes slightly. So because Kepha means rock, then in Greek, the word for rock was Petros. And then in English, the word for rock is Peter. And so, and we'll talk more about this as we go along. And so um, we see with Simon, God changes his name to Kepha, or Peter in English, and, and it means rock. It's a word that means rock. And so this name change is associated with Christ making Simon's God-given mission even more clear through this new name. But we have to continue to look at the context to see, you know, what this mission is and what does this name change mean. And I want to look at the Greek a little bit more, spend a little more time on the Greek. So um, this passage where it says in English, I say to you, talking to Simon, Jesus says to Simon, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So this was the English. The Greek, um, here's the Greek version of this. Um, you can see this kind of written out. And I want to, I want to um, translate this Greek very literally for you. Um, so what it says very literally in the Greek is that I, talking about Jesus, I, and this is very emphatic, also say to you, um, which is singular, talking to Peter, you are, and this is singular present active tense, Petros. And upon this very same Petra, I will be building my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. And so Jesus tells Simon that you're a Petros and on this Petra, I will build my church. So we have to pause a little bit because this Greek can be confusing and some people um, actually debate this as to whether or not Petros and Petra are the same thing or are different. Petros and Petra are both Greek words that mean rock. And so is Jesus referring to the same rock or two different rocks? So is Jesus telling Simon, Simon, your name is now changed to rock and on you, this rock, I will build my church. Or is Jesus saying, Simon, you are now rock. And then on this other rock, I will build my church. I want to look at this just a little bit and I want to try to have an honest analysis of this and look at it from a couple different perspectives because I think it is important that we understand that we understand this as Catholics when we're talking to other people about um, this passage. 
So the question is Petros and Petra, are they the same? Are they different? Now, some people who claim that these are two different Greek words, Petros and Petra, what they'll say is that the Petros means small rock or little rock or pebble. And then they'll say that Petra means a large immovable rock. And so those who hold this view um, will claim that Jesus is bas basically saying, Simon, you are now called a small rock or a pebble, and I will be building my church on a large immovable rock. And so they claim that the church is not built on the man, Simon Peter. And so we would have to say, okay, if you're going to make that um, argument that these are two different rocks, then um, what, what rock is Jesus going to be building his church on? And there's two common proposals. One, one group of people say that the large immovable rock is Jesus. So basically Jesus is telling Simon that I'm changing your name from Simon to a small rock and I will be building my church on myself, Jesus. And so, um, you know, that's a, so that, that's one argument that the large immovable rock that Jesus is building his church on is simply Jesus. And while it's true that Jesus changes Simon's name, that Jesus is making a distinction between Simon, the little rock, the pebble, and then the large immovable rock, <clears throat> excuse me, which is Jesus. Now there's another proposal that says that Simon is, Simon's name is changed to a small rock or a pebble, but the large immovable rock that Jesus will be building his church on is the faith of Peter. Since a moment ago, we just heard, Fader, uh, heard Peter profess the truth of who Christ was. So it shows that Peter had a, had a great faith, that he was able to be inspired by God to preach the truth. And so they say that this large immovable rock is Peter's faith. So these are kind of two common proposals that the Greek words means two different things. Um, and either they'll say it's the church will be built on Jesus or the church will be built on Simon's faith. Now, I would definitely challenge those views because, um, number one, like let's look at the second one first. If they say that the large immovable rock is Peter's faith, then it's interesting because not long after this, Peter is going to deny Jesus three times. He's going to turn away from Christ, um, and then he's going to have to repent and return back to Christ. And so it, there's just some evidence that makes you question, is Peter's faith really a large immovable rock when we see Peter doubting and getting scared and becoming afraid and then abandoning Christ? So it makes me, it, it causes a lot of doubt in my mind that that's in, uh, the best interpretation. The other interpretation that the rock, the large immovable rock is Jesus. Definitely as Catholics, we would say, well, amen. Jesus is the rock on which his church is built. He is the foundation of the church. He is the cornerstone of the church. The church depends on Jesus. Amen. No doubt. And so you could say that that's a possibility that if, if these two words in Greek are different, then Petra is a large immovable rock, which is Jesus, then that, that's fine. That's an okay interpretation, but we still have to answer the question. Well, then if Jesus is the large immovable rock, then why is Simon's name changed? Why is Simon now also called a rock or a small rock? Um, and we'll talk more about some ideas for that here in a minute. So you still have to ask the question that even if Petra is a different type of rock than Petros, why was Simon's name changed? That's, it's a significant event as it rarely ever happens where God changes someone's name. But there is another proposal. Um, the, th um, the other proposal is that Petros and Petra are the same, that they mean the same thing, but that what's happening is that because when um, Matthew's gospel is being written in Greek, Jesus changes P Simon's name to Kepha, which means rock, and in Greek, one of the more common words used for rock was Petra, but Petra is a feminine noun. And so it would be very strange and odd to call a male by a feminine word. 
So St. Peter, a male, it, or I guess Simon, um, Simon is a male, so it'd be odd to call him Petra because it's feminine. It's kind of like um, you would not call a man Josephina or Josephine. You would call him Joseph because there's a feminine and masculine um, kind of character to those words. Well, the same thing with Petra. It's a feminine noun in the Greek language. And so the proposal is that what happened is when they, um, when Matthew wrote in Greek, Petra was chosen as the word for rock, but to make it masculine, um, the word Petros was used for Simon's name. That the intention was that the two words were intended to be the same, but they just altered Petra slightly to make it masculine when assigning it to Simon's new name as rock. So Simon now kepha in Aramaic, rock. So in Greek, they say petros, just to make it a masculine form, a masculine noun. And that um, the proposal here is that when the Greek says, Simon, you are now petros, and on this petra, I will build my church, that they are the exact same rock. That what Jesus is saying is, Simon, I'm changing your name to rock, and it is on you that I'll be building my church. So this is the third proposal. Um... And the majority of scholars today, Catholic and non-Catholic, do argue that the last proposal is the most likely, that most likely it was intended to be the same rock. Petros and Petra are intended to be the same, and that the na- the word Petra was just simply um, changed slightly to a masculine form to give it to Simon as a name. And then what do we as Catholics say? Well, as Catholics, we would we would definitely make the argument that regardless if Petros and Petra are the same rock, if they're the same rock, then it's showing that Jesus is building his church on Simon, on Simon Peter. If you claim that they're two different rocks, we still have to explain why Jesus changes Simon's name. So as I mentioned a minute ago, I think of those options with the Petros and Petra being different, the most likely would be that Petra could be a large immovable rock referring to Jesus. But even if you hold this, why is Simon's name changed to rock? There's a sense that what it's doing is connecting Peter in a unique way to Jesus, the one true rock. So Peter still has this unique relationship as a small rock being in a, in a unique way united to Jesus, the one true rock. And there's still some relationship there that's going to be um, involved in Christ's church that he'll be building. So I still think if you look at the passage that way, you can still under, still recognize that this still shows Simon Peter having a very unique and significant role in the church. But studying the, the, the scholars and what people have to say, it seems most likely to me, as well as to the majority of scholars, that what's intended here is that Petros and Petra are the same and that Jesus is referring, he is changing Simon's name to Rock because he is showing us that Simon Peter will now be the new rock on which Christ will build his church. And I'm going to go into one other reason why I think this is the most likely explanation. And again, it's a matter of looking at the Greek one more time. So if we look at the Greek, we're going to break down um, each of these Greek words. Um, So if you look at this Greek line, so Jesus had said, Simon, you are Petros. And then the next Greek word is Kai, which means and. And when Kai is used, it often connects the two parts of the sentence. It connects the noun that had just come, that it connects the noun preceding the Kai with the noun that's about to follow the Kai. And so that Kai is kind of this joining, um, it joins the two parts. So it says Kai and, and then it says um, epi, which means on. And then tau te te, this to me is a very significant phrase, tau te te, which means this same or this very. And then it will say Petra, rock. And so it does not merely say that Simon, you are now rock, and on this rock I will build my church. But what it says in the Greek is Simon, you are now rock, and on this same rock I will build my church. Or on this very rock I will build my church. And so you get a hint with the Greek that this tau te te is showing us that the Petra, the rock on which Jesus is building his church, 
is to refer back to Simon, the, um, who is now Petros, the new rock. And for Tau Te Te, um, in our English, we, it's often not um, translated as this same rock. It simply says this rock in most translations. But you can find Tau Te Te in other parts of the New Testament where it is translated as this same or this very. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 4, in the King James Version of the Bible, in these two passages, it translates Tau Te Te as this same or this very same. And so I think that's very significant that um, the Greek is actually a little bit more emphatic than what we're seeing on the, in the English that connects Simon Petros, the rock, with Petra, the rock on which Jesus will build his church. But I think even if we continue to look at the remainder of this passage, we start to see that this sentence alone um, by itself could be debated as to whether or not Simon has a significant role, you know, is our Petros and Petra different? But if we read the very next few sentences, we'll start to see that um, the evidence continues to point to Peter, Simon Peter, having a very important and very significant role in Jesus' church. So in the last few minutes of the talk, I want to just focus on the last part of Matthew 16. Because after Jesus tells Simon that he's changing his name to the rock, to Petros or to Kepha, and then on this same rock I will be building my church, Jesus then tells Peter, I will give you, singular to Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this is all singular, Jesus speaking directly to Peter, giving Peter this special authority. But we have to also understand that Jesus is doing something very significant, and if and if we know our Old Testament, we're going to recognize the significance of this immediately. And the apostles, all being Jewish, would have immediately recognized the significance of Jesus' words and what's happening here. And so we, um, we can refer back to Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 to 24, and this will give us a hint into what's happening by looking at what happened in Isaiah 22 and looking at the words that Jesus is using here with Peter. And to set the stage for Isaiah 22, in the Old Testament we have the kingdom of David. And in this Davidic kingdom... The structure would have been to have a king, and then the king would have had a right-hand man, basically a vicar or a prime minister. And this prime minister would have had a um, significant and unique authority in the kingdom. And any time the king had to go away for a time, the prime minister was left in charge of the kingdom. And in Isaiah chapter 22, we, we start to see this. There was a man named Shebna, who was this vicar, the prime minister of the kingdom. But God was upset with him because he was being disobedient and unfaithful. So God removes Shebna from this office of prime minister, and he gives the office to a man named Iliakim. And in Isaiah 22, we see this happening. And then we see that Iliakim is given this office, basically of prime minister, and then we're told that this prime minister is given the keys to the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom are given to the prime minister by the king. And they, rec they represent authority. So that any time the king was away, the prime minister was in charge. And in the Old Testament passage in Isaiah 22, we see that the man holding this office of prime minister was also given a robe and a sash or a girdle which also signified the power that he had in the kingdom. And then in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 22, it also tells us that not only does he have the keys to the kingdom, but the passage says, What he opens, none shall shut, and what he shuts, none shall open. So again, it's this sense of unique authority in the kingdom that the prime minister is given to govern and discipline and to be a uniting figure until the king returns. So he had a very important role in the Old Testament when the king was away. And the prime minister, whenever um, the king gave him, whenever the king selected his prime minister, he would give him the keys to the kingdom, 
He would say the words, you know, what you shut, none shall open. What you open, none shall shut. He'll give him this robe and this sash. Another interesting thing is that this prime minister of the kingdom was not only to wear identifiable vestments or special vestments so that he can be identified by the people. He also had that robe that was a sign of honor and the sash that was a sign of authority. And then we're also told that he was to be the father to the people. So if the king was away, the prime minister was the father figure. He did not replace the king as the ultimate father, but he was to be called father by the people because he reflected the fatherhood of the king. And the role that the prime minister played never was to take away from the role of the king. He was always subject to the king, but he was to be the king's representative until the king returned. So whether it was governing, dis disciplining, guiding, unifying, teaching, whatever it was, he was to play that role until the king returned. So if we understand that Old Testament context, we can now look at Matthew's gospel and see that now similarly, Jesus he is the king of kings. He is coming into the world to establish a new kingdom of God. He will be an everlasting king, and he's establishing an everlasting kingdom. And now we see in Matthew 16, this king is giving the keys of his kingdom to Peter, to Simon Peter. And then he tells Peter, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And we see kind of a similar language what was in Isaiah 22 with the giving of the keys of the kingdom and then the Old Testament says you know what you open none shall shut but there's this similar um, symbolic language of what you bind on earth is bound in heaven so what you bind is bound what you unbind is unbound similar to this kind of image of the door shutting and closing um, so again it's this sense of authority and so we, we can see from this that Peter was, in a sense, made the prime minister of Jesus' kingdom. And once Jesus had gone away, once he had ascended into heaven, Peter would be in charge. And it was a great responsibility that Peter was given. Um, and he would, be holding, he would be held accountable for whether he was faithful or not. And as we saw in the Old Testament, God was watching over his kingdom. And he, God, you know, rebuked Shebna when he failed in his duty. And so there was this expectation of the prime minister to be faithful. And so we see Peter being given the keys of the kingdom, this authority of Jesus' kingdom, so that when P Jesus left, Peter would be in charge. Again, it doesn't take away from Jesus' role. Jesus is still the king. He is still the one who continues to work in the world. Um, Jesus is the one still giving us grace. But Jesus will use Peter as his instrument um, to kind of, for, for, for Peter, the prime minister of his new kingdom, to kind of be this visible person, to be a source of unity and governance and discipline and teaching, so that through Peter, people can be drawn and, and can be, people can come, come into the kingdom. Um, through all of the church, through all of us, but especially in a unique way, Peter would have this unique role as prime minister. And all of the apostles also had a sacred duty, you know, to, to preach and teach and evangelize and to govern. But by Peter being given the keys and being given this role in a sense of prime minister, we see there is this unique role he is to play. And the final thing to note about this role of prime minister in the Old Testament kingdom was that it was an office of succession. So when the prime minister died or vacated his office, another person was appointed his successor. And so we can see take from that that similarly if Peter is made the prime minister of Jesus's kingdom that it too would have been an office of succession so someone would succeed Peter in that role as prime minister of Christ's kingdom and so that's what we hold today is that Saint Peter was the first bishop of Rome and so whoever takes over that office is given the responsibility not only as being bishop of Rome of governing that diocese but is to also, he also inherits this office of basically prime minister, where he has this special duty to, to be a father of the universal church, to guide and govern and discipline and teach and sanctify the universal church, all of Christ's um, earthly kingdom, um, that he would be this unifying figure in the kingdom. So we see 
this is kind of where we're getting this, that this office of St. Peter was handed down to his successors, um, all of the other bishops of Rome, from St. Peter until today, with Pope Francis being given this responsibility. So hopefully, as I've tried to show, is that St. Peter was recognized as being the chief apostle or the preeminent apostle. Now, this did not mean he was to hold himself on a pedestal by any means. His role as a leader was to be one of service, service to his brothers, the other apostles, as we see in Luke 22. He was to comfort them and guide them, keep them united in Christ. It was a role of service to all of God's flock, as we see in John 21, guiding and protecting all of Christ's sheep. And for Peter, it was a role of service to Christ, to be a faithful prime minister in Christ's kingdom, as we see in Matthew 16, 18. And Peter was to be a servant of God, being a faithful witness to the world, to all the truth that Christ came to reveal. You know, and Peter was to cooperate with grace, to be able to lead all of God's people to truth and salvation. And so this was a duty and a responsibility of Peter and of all his successors in a unique way. And so again, it doesn't mean that Peter and his successors would have been sinless. It doesn't mean they would have been perfect, but they had a very unique role were given a great responsibility and a great duty um, to fulfill um, this office, to fulfill this vocation that they're given. And God's going to hold them accountable for how faithful they were in living out this mission, this vocation um, that they received through this office of being a successor to St. Peter. But this is why for 2,000 years, the church has always seen the Bishop of Rome as the successor of St. Peter to be the universal shepherd, to be the pope, um, to be the, the uh, papa, the universal father of the church, and especially to be kind of the source of unity for all of the world's, for all the people of the world, and especially for the people of the church. Um, so the pope has this unifying role because he is the successor of St. Peter. So hopefully that was helpful. If there's confusion on that, please post comments or questions. If you have any additional comments or questions you want to add, please do not hesitate to add those to the comments. So I think people can benefit from all of us sharing our own thoughts on this topic. Um, and if you have ideas for how we can maybe expand on this topic in future videos, I'd be happy to hear that. So share those ideas as well. Um, but again, hopefully this was helpful just to kind of um, show why it is we emphasize that role of St. Peter and then the role of his successors, the apostle, or sorry, the role of St. Peter and the role of his successors as Bishop of Rome, who we call the Pope. And then as we start in this last week, we're going to start to read some of Clement's letter to the Corinthians. And so now you can see why it was significant that Clement was a Pope, Pope Clement, the third successor to St. Peter, why it is that we recognize Clement would have had this same role as being a universal father to all the church, why it is that Clement felt a special duty to write this letter to the Corinthians because what you'll see over this next week's readings is that the Christians in Corinth are struggling. They're having an issue in Corinth. And then we have this letter sent all the way from Rome, Italy to the people of Corinth from Clement. And you'll see that the reason Clement writes this letter is because he is the Pope of the church. He's the successor to St. Peter and because he held that office of Bishop of Rome, successor to St. Peter, he had a responsibility not only to his local diocese of Rome, but also responsibility to the universal church, to guide the people, to discipline the people, to teach the people, to sanctify the people. And you'll see that Clement recognizes this role when he writes that letter to the Corinthians. And we'll talk more about this next week. All right, so hopefully this was helpful. Um, I'll let you get back to, to your reading, and we'll just conclude in prayer. And again, don't hesitate to post questions or comments. Um, we'll pray the glory be together. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. St. Peter, pray for us. St. Clement, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. All right, amen, and God bless you. Have a good have a good good day and a good week.